The Fan Counters Celebrity Podcast, number 171. Coming to you from nowhere near the entertainment capital of the world, this is the Fan Counter Celebrity Podcast. You were like the uh, carrot top of interviewers. Wow, how disappointing was that question? You did not just ask me that. Well, that's a big question. Never mind, I'm, I'm done. I'm not doing the show. Wow, I can't believe it. I'm telling you, I'm I'm hooked. Nick, 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 Nick. Yeah, he's so awesome. He's um, so a good friend of mine. Welcome to the Fan Counter Celebrity Podcast. My name's Nick. And I'm Tracy. And you can find us on social media. Go to Instagram. A lot of you are migrating over there. Welcome to Instagram at Fan Counters Live. We're also on Facebook. Join the group Fan Counters, or you can go to Sharpie Nation. We haven't updated that as much as we should have because it seems like everybody's going to Instagram, and I kind of drop the ball sometimes on updating more than one social media platform a week. So Yeah, that, that can be tough sometimes. It's a lot. Uh, so join us over there on Instagram. I'm way more active there. And uh, we'd love to have you on our social media. If you want to send us a guest request or if you have a comment or question about the show, you can send it off to us at hello at fancounters.com. Now, Tracy, we are here this week with a director of some amazing films from the late 70s, 80s, and even this decade. He's still making films. Yes, he is. It's amazing. He's been around for over 50 years, uh, 50 years since the release of Let's scare Jessica to death. We're talking about the director, John D. Hancock. But before we get to him, have you watched anything great on streaming services or television or anything? Um, replays of stuff. Replays? What are you watching? Yeah. Golden Girls? I haven't yet, but that sounds like a good idea. No. <laughs> it's on was Hulu. Wa- you was can. I was watching uh, ER and... Um, I had never watched Blue Bloods before. And so oh, Tom I, Selleck. Yeah, so I uh, started watching Blue Bloods, and I'm really liking that show. Yeah, season one was really good. That's when I stopped watching, though. It just didn't keep me. Yeah. But the one thing that did get me is I had a coworker at school tell me about this show on Netflix called Crime Scene, The Vanishing at the Cecil Hotel. And it's a hotel that's on Skid Row in Los Angeles, downtown. And so there's a lot of CD activity going on. And I don't know if you've heard anything about this story, but there's a woman. Um, oh, man. Now I'm not going to have. Oh, here it is. Uh, Elisa Lamb was the name of the woman. And she went missing after staying at the Cecil Hotel. Really? Now, there's rumors that this hotel is haunted. I don't know if that's true or not. But the video that they present of the last moments of this woman's life that's captured on video is quite creepy. Um. Maybe, you know, maybe she got carried away by rats or something like that. (laughs) I've been to L.A. and when I was there, there was there was a lot of them. I don't want to give it away, uh, but they did find her. She was she was located, not alive. Uh, So she did die. And the way she died is under speculation. And that is the point of this documentary series. It's only four episodes, 50 minutes per episode. And we started at at eight o'clock at night. And I thought, well, we'll watch the first one and see if we're gripped. Well, we were. Had to watch number two. After number two, I'm like, well, it's only 10 o'clock. I can hang out for one more episode. And we did. And then I'm like, well, there's only one more left. We might as well make it till midnight and watch the whole thing. So did you oversleep in the morning then? No, 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 no. But, you know, I got to tell you, the fourth episode is really a throwaway. Everything that they said in one through three is like re-presented in number four. Oh, okay. So So it's like a do-over. Yeah, yeah. Recap. Like I was falling asleep, and um, this was really weird. My wife has kept thinking it was only like a few minutes left, so she's walking around. She's standing behind me for like five minutes. I'm like, I can't watch this with you behind me. <laughs> it was creepy. <laughs> so we turned off. I think we didn't watch the last fifteen minutes, but no. I, there was nothing really. I think we missed. But it's good though, huh? It was good. I'm gonna have to check it out. I definitely recommend it. Yeah, yeah we'll especially if you can do it all in one sitting. Uh, it's kind of one of those shows where you might not ever come back to it. I like doing those because, like, uh, you know, um, Julio Iglesias, or not Julio, Gabriel Iglesias, yeah. comedian, mm-hmm. he does that show, Mr. Iglesias, and it's like eight episodes and they're half an hour episodes, yep. and, or 10, whatever. 22 minutes. Yeah, and it's like, oh, I just got to watch the next one. And I watch that. It's like one sitting and I watch all of them. Right. <laughs> oh, it's easy to do. Uh, all right, we're going to get into our show this week. John D. Hancock is here and I guess because there's a John L. Hancock who's also a director and he doesn't want to get confused and I was almost scared I was prepping questions for the wrong guest well good thing you didn't do that I didn't do that and uh, we have another video podcast by the way this if you're listening to the audio portion you can go to YouTube and see us interview John 
on YouTube. Just search for Fan Counters Podcast and subscribe to the channel, and you'll get video of all of our upcoming shows. And we've got some good ones coming up. But and subscribe, subscribe, subscribe. Yeah, I know I'm doing my post show stuff right now, and I shouldn't do that. So let's throw it right to the show, and then we'll wrap it up after. All right. Okay. Here is John D. Hancock, a wonderful, amazing director, and we're very honored to have him on the Fan Counters Celebrity Podcast. John Hancock, welcome to the Fan Counters Celebrity Podcast. Thanks for joining us today. Oh, it's wonderful to be here. Now, we're going to dive into some of our favorite moments from your career, but first, I kind of want to start a little bit at the beginning. In 1970, going all the way back, you received a grant from the American Film Institute that allowed you to direct a short film called Sticky My Fingers, Fleet My Feet, and you received an Academy Award nomination for the short film. Do you think that was kind of your springboard into, you know, the success in the movie industry, like your, your way in? Yeah, definitely. I mean, uh, uh, I wouldn't have had a career without that. Uh, and so I'm very grateful to the AFI. Uh, I got my first two features out of that. Uh, the uh, woman named uh, Kathy Weiler, William Weiler's daughter, was working as a uh, development person for Joe Levine, who was a big producer in New York at that point. And she saw it the short and recommended me to the Mosses, BS Moss Enterprises, and they wanted to make a scary picture that turned out to be Let's Scare Jessica to Death. Yeah. And CBS bought that short that I did and showed it uh, during halftime on their Thanksgiving Day football game. So that had a big big audience and there was a guy in Chicago named Maurice Rosenfield who wanted to make a picture about baseball mm -hmm. and he saw that and thought oh here's a director that could do it and that's how I ended up doing Bang the Drum slowly so I got my first two feature jobs from that short. Awesome that's pretty cool. Um, so you have two special Blu-rays that have recently been released with your director's commentary on them your first feature film Let's Scare Jessica to Death and the second is California Dreaming. Being around for the 50th anniversary of anything is an accomplishment, and that's exactly what's happening this year for Let's Scare Jessica to Death. Did you write the film knowing you would direct it? Yeah, I did. I did. They, I was sent a script uh, called uh, It Drinks Hippie Blood, <laughs> uh, <laughs> which was like a parody of a scary picture. And I told the bosses uh, that I would do it, but I, I didn't want to do a parody of a scary picture. I wanted to do a scary picture. And you know, I would do it if they would let me rewrite it, and they did. And, and uh, I, I mean, I, I kept a few things from the, the original thing I was sent, but mainly I just wrote something new. I did it under a pseudonym. I, there were things in the picture that the mosses wanted me to put in that I didn't, uh, I wasn't proud of. So I, I wrote it as, uh, Ralph Rose. Really? Yeah. But I, it was, I should have just put my name on it. What was I being so fussy for? You know? <laughs> well, maybe you're nervous at the time that it yeah, might have sure. repercussions. You don't know. Right. It's definitely sure. a different time. What I found interesting is you said that when you were writing that script, you scared yourself writing it. And I'm sure that was kind of a tongue-in-cheek comment, but you must have felt good about the potential that it had. I did. No, it wasn't tongue-in-cheek. I did. I, I was living uh, in a place called uh, Sneedon's Landing, which was an old uh, Tory community uh, up the Hudson, about 40 minutes up the Hudson in New York. And it was all these... It is kind of a spooky place, all these old houses. And and um, I remember one particular scene where I was writing it at night, and I it, it really scared me. And, and it, it turned out to be very scary in the movie, too. I, I, so I, I, I do think that's a guide. If you scare yourself, you're probably on good, good ground. <laughs> that, that's kind of like sitting there and watching a scary movie late at night and then realizing what's going on around my house right <laughs> yeah it was it had that feeling you know it had oh yeah. <laughs> but um, i enjoyed doing that picture was fun to do i uh, the the mosses uh 
a lot of producers don't necessarily add too much. I mean, yeah, they get you the money or they hire you or they, or, or, you know, they can handle the, the logistics, but the Mosses were exhibitors. They had the Criterion Theater in New York and they had maybe, I don't know, six or eight or 10 other uh, movie theaters around New England. And so they had a lot of experience with audiences. So I tended to listen to them more than I would have ordinarily. Uh, when they said, well, here's this scene, that's when they'll go get candy. <laughs> so, I, you know, I tended to lighten up on the candy scenes. Uh -huh. And they wanted a seance. Uh, and there was no reason to put a seance in the movie, but I did because they said people will like it. Very cool. They, I mean, the knowledge of audiences, if, if you're in the theater and you have out of town tryouts and you have a lot of previews and that kind of thing, you do get a, and, and then you go back and you watch it with different audiences as the play runs, you do get a sense of, of audience that is not necessarily something that a lot of people in film have. I mean, I, I don't know that people have enough screenings as they polish things. Sometimes they do, but. I certainly do. I, I polish my pictures with a screening and recut for a week or two, a screening, re I mean, over and over. Uh, that can be misleading to some degree. It depends on who comes to the screening, doesn't it? But <laughs> yeah. um, if you can get big screenings, where so it's really a general audience, uh, it's, re it's extremely helpful. With the new Blu-ray being released, you were were you impressed with the conversion to HD, or did you feel that your intended look was lost? I was very happy with it. Yeah, I think they did a very good job in both pictures. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'm not an enemy of, of digital. I mean, I've been shooting. The last four or five pictures I've done have been uh, digital. And uh, what do I miss about film? Well, there is something about film that's uh, fun to work with. And maybe it does look slightly better than digital. I'm, I'm not certain. I mean, digital has gotten so good. But it doesn't look better than digital long. I mean, the prints get so battered so quickly in mm -hmm. theatrical. You know, um, so you, it's all scratched and I mean, uh, and you don't, you know, it's, it's remains pristine in, in digital. The other thing too, is you will, uh, you go through a series of answer prints with actual celluloid, right? And you're getting the colors just right, just right. Mm -hmm. And finally you get this magnificent looking thing, but then they, they don't make the prints, the release prints from that negative, they then make an inner negative. So what you've seen through that process of refining the colors and getting the answer print so it looks perfectly is all of a sudden grainy for the release prints. So uh, that's a disappointing process that people are not seeing. Or realizing wonder. that it even yeah, occurs. Yeah, they're not realizing they aren't seeing. Yeah. Right. I, I think there's something special still about those films from the late 70s and 80s. The grain in them, the just the, the the rawness of film versus the digital. It's something that we may not see again, but certainly, you well, know, that's, that's why... question of how much grain. I mean, you have in, in the, the magnificent answer print that you worked so hard through a series of four or five or six of them to achieve has grain in it. But uh, then when they make an inner negative and then strike prints from that, it's more grain than 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 you wanted. Gotcha. Yeah. Well, this year we did lose Tanya Roberts. She starred in another film that you did called California Dreaming. It's the other Blu-ray release that's come out this year. And to honor her memory, can you reflect just for the audience here a few of those special moments that you guys shared on the set of California Dreaming and, and maybe even after things that you remember about her? Well, of course, I remember how phenomenally pretty she was. <laughs> uh very very pretty very sexy girl uh i we got along entirely i mean she 
uh, I think she created a certain trouble in the cast by seducing every guy in the cast. <laughs> and then it's an interesting challenge. Them. So it made unhappy unhappy actors. Oh, yeah. I can imagine. But uh she was fun. She uh I think roomed on the location with uh Stacy Nelkin. Who played the other girl in, in uh, California Dreaming? And Stacy Nelkin had had been the act, Woody Allen's girlfriend that Manhattan is based on. She, when she was in high school, she was Woody Allen's girlfriend. That you know, the part in the Manhattan is played by Mariel Hemingway. Hmm. But so it was these two pretty hot girls rooming together, and and uh, I remember. Uh, Seymour Cassell, kind of an old guy in the picture, right, uh, would get liquored up and try to break into their room at night. And that was one of the things we had to contend with. <laughs> he called them Titty and Twatty. Oh, jeez. Oh, wow. <laughs> tried to always to break into their that room. That would get him canceled in 2021. Yeah, no kidding. Oh, I know. You, no can't, kidding. you can't break into girls' rooms anymore. No. Yeah. Or have nicknames like that. No. Yeah. No. Um, that movie obviously was about. It about, wasn't so good then. I wasn't. I wasn't fond of it then. Yeah. Right. The movie was uh, about surfing. Uh, being from Indiana with no ocean near you, uh, was that a challenge for you? Sure. I mean, I had to try to learn how to. I never was able to stand up on a surfboard, but somehow I managed to direct the picture anyway. <laughs> with a, a with a, a boogie board or a body board or something. I. But yeah, sure. Uh, I was not. Uh, part of surf culture in Malibu. I lived in Malibu for 20 years, but um, and my stepdaughter dated some of the uh, most wanted surfers, most wanted for drugs or whatever. Oh, oh wow. So I was not I was not pro surfer when I did the picture, and maybe I was uh, a little hard on them in the picture hmm. as I look back on it, but. Um, it, it was written by uh, Ned Wynn that's the grandson of Ed Wynn and the son of Keenan Wynn and he was had you know surfed a lot in his uh, teens and so he was he knew about surfing I, I learned I had surfing experts to help me okay um, you have an interesting, uh, way of filming things to keep yourself at home because you filmed them at home. Uh, one of the first films you filmed on your family farm was Prancer, which is something that Tracy makes sure he watches every Christmas. Yep. Um, oh, great. so what made you decide to film at your own location and, and how difficult was it? You know, was it with, cause you're bringing in lots of people and lots of activity into a smaller town. Did you ever get pushback from the community about that? No, they loved it. I mean, uh, I be, because of Prancer, because uh, Sam Elliott was so good with the community, uh, drinking with wealthy guys in bars, and and Abe Vigoda was good, and Cloris, and it was it was an extremely uh, happy experience for this area, and uh, I've. That's why I've come back. It was so positive that I've wanted to repeat it. So I've filmed, I think, five or six things here. Yeah. Um, and we get tremendous cooperation from the area. I mean, I've, the, I've, on a couple of these pictures, I've had 20 restaurants feed the cast and crew on a revolving basis on deferment without, without laying out cash or wow. a, a local uh, car dealer that provided cars on deferment for the cast and crew to drive in or motel for people to stay at all. I mean, there's tremendous, uh, cooperation. You, we had a location on, uh, suspended animation. And if we had shot it in LA, you know, they want like $10,000 a day to here. They said, Oh, you know, you can use it. And if we'll go stay at a motel, so we don't bother you. <laughs> oh my wow. gosh. I mean, I it's, it's a dream place to because it's not spoiled. I mean, it's yeah. 
Well, not if a lot of films in Indiana. They're not jaded, yeah. I suppose you uh, don't have a problem getting extras then either, do you? No, exactly. I had 1,200 extras for uh, a piece of Eden that uh, showed up one day uh, and brought their own lunch. Wow. <laughs> and about 800, 800 of them came back another day. I mean, extraing That's is amazing. quite boring. So yeah. Yeah. that showed you know, a real desire to to help and to be part of something and and i do feature a lot of local people so they get to see themselves on screen and it's fun yeah that's pretty cool are you negotiating all these little deals with the restaurants and stuff do you have people doing that for you or is it because of your personal connection you're able to get this push through well i have people doing it but uh some of it i do myself yeah okay uh the looking glass is a movie that you also filmed on your property uh, it's also known as Swan Song. It has two different titles. What's the official title of that? Uh, the Looking Glass. Uh, we tested. Uh, we originally called it Swan Song. Okay. <clears throat> and uh, I got a lot of feedback that it, that was a depressing title. <laughs> uh, so we went to a local multiplex. Uh, with four possible or six possible titles and pulled the people going in and out. Uh, that Mostly the audience going in and out of American Sniper, which was not the ideal audience for us. <laughs> not for that <laughs> film, no. But we, I thought at least their sense of what was a, uh, a good title. And Swan Song uh, pulled last of, of the six titles. So we figured... Maybe even though we wanted to call it that, that wasn't smart. Well, The Looking Glass is more audience-friendly. It also makes me think of Alice in Wonderland a little bit. Um, yeah. Now, I couldn't wi- write a project with my wife. That would never work out because I would love something so much and she would criticize it and then I would be sleeping on the couch because we wouldn't have a great interaction about that. <laughs> uh, I know that you wrote this with your wife, so how do you both share what you like or don't like in a scene and and how do you decide what to keep without it affecting your mood towards each other? Uh, by not discussing it. Uh, when we first started writing together, uh, the system we had is we would pass things back and forth. And this was before, uh, you know, computers. So it was uh, IBM Selectric typewriters. And if you were willing to retype it, the rule was you could leave out whatever you didn't like. And then the other person would put it back in if they had to have it. (laughs) So it it avoided those discussions where that really stinks and you get your feelings hurt. You just get a, you get a version back of the scene with the bad parts left out uh, by someone that you respect and you figure has the same interest that you do. Mm Mm-hmm. I mean, her interests were not separate. You know, our careers were linked. Um, so you don't have the shame of, of having to say, yeah, I guess that's terrible. Uh, you just maybe don't even notice that it's gone. Okay. Yeah. That's a good way to so, do it. Yeah, it was good. It um, worked. So, you know, with your wife starring in that film, we've heard you say that you don't need to do much directing if you cast the film well. Has that been true your entire career? I think so, yeah. I mean, even when I started in the theater, I would uh, get lucky with pieces of casting and, and realize, oh, isn't that wonderful? You can just sit back. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's my ideal posture, is just to be in the rehearsal or on the set or in the performance and just, oh, isn't that wonderful? And not have to... Uh, not have to direct. I, I have no, I mean, I'm very interested in power, but I have no absolute need to tell people what to do. I mean, if, if they're doing it and it's great already, I don't, uh, if it's not broke, don't mess with it. Got it. Okay. Uh, this film was also filmed at your house. Are you ever, uh, Oh, you know, you're very aware probably of what the set looks like. Are you aware of kind of showing off too much of your personal uh, property or your personal effects in a film because this is your space? No. 
I, I, I don't mind that. Oh, uh, I'm proud. <laughs> proud of my, my hedges. Maybe I, I show too much, you know, I'm, I'm maybe I, I need to lighten up on proudness. Um, but, uh, I'll tell you to have a film crew invade your house is not something to undertake lightly. Um, and it's really brought to my attention how brutally film crews, uh, treat locations. Uh, I mean, they wipe their ass on the towels and they, uh, <laughs> leave, leave trash around and, wow. you know, I mean, it's, so I've, I've, I threaten, <laughs> uh, but in the case of, uh, a piece of Eden, even threatening, uh, there was still uh, the dolly track uh, scratched the floor and mm. the, the taped up lights uh, brought down the plaster and oh, no. uh, but I, I had I've had one bad experience which was uh, with damage to the house uh, and then when we came to do um looking glass somehow uh i had a co-producer that had all kinds of cheap sold um cleaning supplies and safety supplies to corporations in the area so she was able to provide booties for the cast and crew to wear so they didn't mm -hmm. mess up your floors too much floor. yeah so it was also they were very careful with the cables my, so my wife wouldn't trip at night you know i mean we it was it was not i didn't feel i felt invaded obviously but i, yeah. I didn't feel destroyed on, on the last pictures and, and what does that do for your wife because you know in in my home at least my wife is pretty meticulous about the caretaking and how she wants things done in our home <laughs> uh did that make her more anxious than you I don't know. <laughs> that's probably a good thing that, he's, yeah. that you don't know. <laughs> the last picture we did, uh, that's, it's actually out on Amazon prime. Now the girls of summer, and I hope people listen to this and watch it. Yeah. About a, a country girls band. We shot it a lot of, uh, scenes at a local farm, not our farm. Okay. And, uh, it, it, it actually drove the wife there crazy. The husband was all for it, but the wife, uh, felt totally invaded and it became a, you know, a difficult problem with her, her unhappiness with our rearranging of her furniture and bringing, putting different pictures up on the wall and that kind of stuff. Yeah. Okay. And letting bugs in, in the middle of summer and, you know, letting flies in. Oh yeah. With doors being open and stuff. I can imagine. Yeah, yeah sure. Going in and out with lights and, you know. So we want to jump to Echo Boomers, a film that's directed by Seth Savoy, which appears to be his first feature. It appears you were his mentor on the film. Did he approach you to help him out? He did. He was, um, he, he'd been a student of mine at Columbia College, and I liked him, and we remained friends after that. And uh, he sent me the screenplay and asked me what I thought, and I gave him notes. And he, I think he felt, it would be convincing to uh, potential, potential uh, money people if he had uh, an experience, if he offered to have an experienced director on the set sure, uh, to back him up. And I was willing to do that. It, as it turned out, it didn't seem necessary, and he went out and did it by himself. So you didn't supervise really much at all? No, I gave notes on the on the rough cut and, and on the screenplay. I didn't, I was not there. No. Okay. Uh, cause I, I was... mean, I talked to him about, I mean, I, I think before he started to shoot it, we had a lunch and I tried to guide him how to deal with the crew and the cast and, you know, and Michael Shannon. And, I mean, I, I did mentor him, but I was not on the set. 
All right. I was because I was going to ask you, Patrick Schwarzenegger is in that film, Arnold's son. So I wondered if uh, any of that remind you know if you were able to see him work and if it reminded you of Arnold Schwarzenegger himself. But no, uh, never got that far. No, okay. I, I wasn't on the set. I I I saw the movie, of course, several times. But yeah, yeah. Okay. Does he remind me of Arnold? No. Does he remind you of Arnold? No. Um, not I, Arnold not entirely. So Since you know he's from Arnold. <laughs> He yeah, kinda, right. Yeah, your yeah. psychology it, thinks it so. would not come to you though. You no. wouldn't say, "Oh my God, it's another Schwarzenegger." No. Um, one thing I want to know in regards to directing. Obviously, you have DPs that are setting up shots, and this is what I've always wondered. And I'm really glad I get to talk to you about this. So I know that you have a vision of how you want things to look, but are there times when you've like leaned on the DP to come up with how to shoot something or what the shot's going to look like, or is it all the director all the time? Well, it, it, it varies from director to director and DP to DP. Uh, I, I try to uh, say where to put the camera and to some degree leave it to the DP how to light it. Okay. Um, now, I know Woody Allen on all those wonderful pictures he made with Gordy Willis, he would kind of just leave it to Gordy Willis where to put the camera and how to shoot it. And they got wonderful results. So uh, that's not how I work. But uh, there are a lot of ways to skin a cat, you know. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I want to to say what the lens is and where the camera is and what the, the camera sees. And and uh, but I don't know enough about lighting to light it myself. So I leave that to the DP. And okay. then say, well, maybe you need a little more fill. I mean, I'd make little adjustments. Uh -huh. uh, what about storyboarding? Is every shot that you do storyboarded ahead of time? Well, I've storyboarded um, difficult pieces of action. Okay. But uh, I don't draw well enough. Yeah. To, uh, but I've worked with several times with, excellent storyboard artists and they really are good and uh it, that's helped enormously but uh, i i try to plan but not over plan i mean uh i want to work with the actors and figure out how to shoot it mm -hmm. rather than having a shot already worked out that you then cram the performances into uh, i love actors and i love good acting in films and uh that's kind of my approach to it i guess i could never be a storyboarder because i'd be writing drawing stick people <laughs> yeah that's what i do and it's 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 not that helpful <laughs> <laughs> doesn't really get the vision going <laughs> you know i wish i wish early on i'd taken a course in drawing mm. you know it would have been very useful to me if i had just learned how to sketch you have done so, well without it, though. Yes, definitely. <laughs> but maybe it's not too late. <laughs> no, it's not. Never too late. Never too late. You're still breathing, so you got that. Yeah. In. So you've been able to work with some of the Hollywood's greatest, uh, like Cloris Leachman, Robert De Niro, Nick Nolte. Um, do you have any stories that you want to share about them and, and something that we don't know about them? Well, De Niro worked uh he said to me you know there may be better actors but no one will ever work harder hmm. and i found that to be true i mean his the amount of research he did and the amount of of preparation uh he also worked very physically i mean he had researched the character he's playing in bang that i'm slowly has uh, hodgkin's disease and he had so he'd researched that and found out well you're nauseated so before the scenes where he was supposed to be sick, he would stick his finger down his throat and bring himself to almost throwing up. Wow. Yeah. And the, no, the crew hated it, but I let <laughs> him do it because I, I liked the performance. And then in, in the final game where he also found out it, with Hodgkin's, you can be dizzy a lot. So before each take, he would whirl until he couldn't stand up. And then we would shoot him. 
on it. So he wasn't like acting dizzy. He was dizzy. Wow. Uh, cool. And I thought that added a lot. And I, I was very impressed with that way of working. And when Nolte and I were doing weeds, I mentioned how De Niro approached some of these things. He says, oh, yeah, when I want to be uptight, I put a cork up my ass. <laughs> so, okay, that'll make me watch that movie if I ever get to again in a whole <laughs> new way. Yeah. Um, so we always ask on fan counters if you've ever had fans kind of come up to you and leave a mark on, on your memory, have you have any, had any interesting encounters with people who have recognized you and adored your work or maybe didn't adore your work? No, I get, you know, I don't, it's, I'm not in the movie, so I don't get physically recognized, but when, when they found out, when people find out what I've done, they often will come up and say how much they enjoyed it and this and that. Have I had women offer themselves? Okay, there you go. You asked the question for me. <laughs> oh, right after Bang That I'm Slowly, yes, but not that didn't last long. Okay. Is there any opportunity in your career that you passed on and now regret it today? Yes, a couple. Uh, one of them was I was offered Glory. Oh, oh. good movie. Wonderful movie. The script I was sent was not nearly as good, and I didn't I didn't think they could fix it. I, it was very, the African-American characters in it were very condescended to. And I thought, boy, the black audience is going to hate this. Mm. And it was uh, produced by uh, a, an ex-agent named Freddie Field. And I was, I didn't think Freddie Field would be able to fix the script. And I was afraid of him because he was a legendary uh, uh, evil genius of a certain kind. So I, I should not have passed on that. I should have tried to help them fix the script. And uh, the other one was uh, a picture that became the China Syndrome. Okay. Wow. Uh, Michael Douglas and Jane Fonda came to me with a script uh once again that wasn't good it was about two guys and and uh they wanted it changed so that it would have a part for jane and this and that and that i would have done except it was uh i had to be exclusive to it it was it was a development deal but they wanted the director to be i couldn't do anything else and i felt that that was a trap and that I needed to uh, to do a picture that was a pay or play that was I needed to do a go picture right uh, I and in retrospect I probably just should have said yes and and uh, uh, cheated and you know you can if you sign two mutually exclusive exclusive deals what are they going to do to you you know <laughs> Well, you but, just better be available for each project <laughs> when they need you. Yeah, right. <laughs> um, one of the I know it's a, kind of a sore subject, but it is one of those topics of your career that people still talk about. And I'm I don't know how you feel about talking about Jaws too. Um, is that some, somewhere well, I was you... fired, uh, and it was very painful, and I got kind of ground up between uh, Dick Zanuck and Sid Sheinberg you know, who were settling scores about whose wife gets to be in the picture and about the overages on the first picture. And I was Zanuck's choice. And uh, he fought for me very hard. And finally, Scheinberg fired me. But it was uh, extremely unpleasant. Yeah. <laughs> was it something to do with the story, though, where you were kind of going more, very much more character people focused but everybody's like, you know, they wanted it to be all about the shark and you felt like it needed no, more I, than, more I, than I wanted, that. I was, I was very interested in people being chomped up. I wanted the shark to, <laughs> uh, I, I had a vision that the Island Amity Island, uh, needed to be in a kind of po post-traumatic, uh, state that they've had a shark attack and that the place needed to be uh economically boarded up a little bit and fighting for its life and uh, i i wanted a 
a scarier look. I mean, the first Jaws is shot just like in uh, conventional American Technicolor photography, right? I mean, it's mm-hmm. looks like other pictures. I, I wanted a much colder, spookier look, a haunted look. I you know, that haunted would have been by good. the first. That would, yeah. I think that would be cool. And the studio okayed that, but then when they saw the dailies, they liked it less. And so that was that was one of the elements too. There was also a uh, a very famous editor named Verna Fields who had cut the first Jaws picture mm-hmm. and thought she should have been offered the the directorship of the second because she her contribution to the first Jaws picture was so big. So she was always in the background, uh, and eventually they did. After they fired me, they did offer her the picture, and but the the DGA said no, you cannot replace a DGA director with one of your executives. At that point, she was a, a vice president of the Universal. So okay. that was so they hired Jonna Schwark, and he and Verna lived in Dorothy's in my house that we had rented, and uh, I think she kind of directed it through Jonna. Huh. But so she couldn't take the credit, but she was behind my back a lot of the time shooting the dailies down. So that was another aspect. There were I was kind of surrounded by people who thought they should have been directing it. Gotcha. There's it sounds like a lot of politics more than oh, even was, just you. Was, I, I, I never. I had never dealt in a bureaucracy like that before. And my father, you know, didn't work for a big corporation. So there was no dinner table conversation about how you, how you, um, you deal in that kind of situation. There was an incident early on while Dorothy and I were working on the script, uh, the Scheinbergs, it's Sid Scheinberg and his wife who plays the lead, the female lead in the movie. Had us, had us to dinner and were very nice and really very complimentary about the script. And they, they said that they wanted her to go out on the boat in this sequel, okay. right, to rescue the children. Mm-hmm. And um, Dorothy and I said, okay. It, it was kind of a feminist point they were making, and we thought that would be fine. So we told Zanuck, and he said, over, over my dead body. So if I had had more experience in how to deal, I would have said, I need to meet with the two of you, Zanuck and Scheinberg, and you need to give me clear instructions whether Lorraine goes out on the boat or not. Uh, But I knew if I asked to do that, Zanuck would hate me. (laughs) He would feel betrayed by that. But I needed to do it anyway. I should have done it anyway, and I didn't. I I, I said, I'm going to have to choose between these two guys. And Dick Zanuck is my friend, and I really like him. And his father was a wonderful producer and a director. And I like his pictures. And Sid Scheinberg is just a lawyer. And who knows how long he'll be around. Sure. Of course, he ended up around forever. (laughs) But but, uh, so we turned to the next draft with Lorraine not out on the boat. And uh, Scheinberg never met my eyes in the Universal Commissary again. Oh, wow. So perhaps my goose was cooked right with that. I don't know. But, and I mean, uh, I, I didn't know that that was what you had to do. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I'd always r- kind of run things myself, you know, and I didn't know. I didn't really know how to work for other people uh, like I needed to do in that circumstance. Okay. Well, a new film coming out that you did have full control over was The Girls of Summer. We touched on it briefly before, yeah. but uh, has that, that's been released now uh, to on demand, or where, where are we finding yeah, that? Yeah, it's on uh, uh, Hulu, and it's on Amazon Prime, and it's it's a lot of different places, yeah. And so you said it's about it's a music group of girls. Yeah, it's about a country girls band, and it's uh, got a lot of wonderful songs in it, and the music is good. I mean, the songs are good, so people really like it. Country fan here. I'm going to have to check that one out. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh. Um, do you have any new projects in the works that you want to share with us? I do. I, I've used this COVID time to write three different things, and uh, one of them is about a New York detective who falls in love with a serial killer. 
Nice. Ooh. That's a good one. One of them is about kind of idealistic bank robbers uh, with families and a kind of strange downward spiral with these guys. And, and uh, the third is um, Midsummer Night's Dream. Years ago, I, I won an Obie in the New York theater for a very strange production of Midsummer Night's Dream, very erotic. And I'd like to make a film not based on that production, but with some of the same impulses. Okay. So you got two full scripts done during this COVID yeah. pandemic time? Yep. Wow. That's pretty impressive. I haven't done anything. <laughs> I watched a lot of Netflix. <laughs> Feeling really bad about myself now. Uh, John, do you stay active on social media? Are, are you anywhere where people can find you? Sure, Facebook. Okay. Yeah. Uh, you and film, filmmakers, my company has a Facebook site too. Oh, F I L M A C R E S. Excellent. Yeah. Well, we really appreciate your time today chatting about well, films. I've enjoyed this. I've really... enjoyed this. Thank you. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. All right. Excellent. Uh, we'll talk sometime. Our thanks to John Hancock for joining us on the show this week. I learned a lot because as a director of web series and films, and, and we're making a film now. Uh, I always wondered about that role between a director and a DP, and now I finally have my answer. That's pretty cool. He was he was really cool. I, I loved hearing some of the stuff he was talking about. I think I fit right in with him, though, because I can't draw, and I don't know how to light anything. Yeah, I can't draw either. Stick people. But That's we're it. lit pretty well here. We're looking at lights, and yeah. I, I think I got this set pretty much rocking. Yeah, you got this one good, man. Okay, good. Uh, we were back next week with another celebrity guest. Please join us and make sure you subscribe on YouTube. You can get all of our video podcasts uh, alerted to you via email if you hit subscribe. And uh, that's going to do it for us. All right. Have a good week, buddy. You too, man. <laughs> see, we'll you see you next week, week everybody. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.